Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in Guyana over the past week or so. And as is the norm, we always have a packed agenda of issues worthy of discussion. Tonight is no different. I want to welcome all of our viewers who are joining us on television from region number five. Welcome to another program of issues in the news across the Burbies River on the east bank of the Burbies River. In region number six, all of you who are joining us on television in New Amsterdam along the east bank of the Burbies River, Kanji, and along the Quarantine Coast, welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. To those of you who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and as far as Australia, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. I see many of you have already joined us. Please press that share button on your phone. Press that share button on your computer or on your iPad or whatever device you're using to view this program. Share it so that your friends, your followers, and all those who are on your account can become part of tonight's discussion. Please, again, ensure that you share this program wide and far so that we have the largest possible audience. And ensure also that you interact, you ask questions, you offer your comments in the comment section of the live so that I can respond and we can engage each other. As I said, I want this program to be as interactive as possible. It is not a unilateral or a mono monologue. I want it to be a discussion, and I want you to become part of the discussion. Mohammed Zakir Yusuf, Mahendra Prasad, Hari Riki Ram, Krishna Dan Paul, Nick Narayan, Fazlur Ali, um, all of you, Christian Dad Kelawan, welcome, welcome, welcome. And Hill, Jack, Jack Dale, welcome to another program of issues in the news. So, our General Secretary and the Vice President of our country, Comrade Bharat Jack Dale, is once again in the news. There is a section in the media, and there is a segment of our population. Whenever PPP leaders or PPP government ministers are featured anywhere in a manner that it is possible to draw an adverse inference so that a negative story can emerge, they capitalize upon it. And in the news currently is a classical or a classic example of what I'm speaking about. And leading in that regard is Vice President Bharat Jagdeo. Today I woke up to screaming headlines in certain sections of the media that Guyana is being grilled at the United Nations Human Rights Committee over allegations of corruption in respect of Mr. Bharat Jagdeo. And I had to call my colleague, Minister Gail Teixeira, who is representing Guyana at that forum, to understand what is going on. And 
Mr. Shearer reported or informed me that there was a singular statement made, or if one wishes to coin it into a question, a singular question was asked. In two days of interaction, and the statement is, and I took what she told me verbatim, the statement is, there is public frustration due to the failure of the government to investigate reports of acts of corruption by the vice president, the judiciary, and the police. And that was the question or the statement made. Let me repeat it. There is public frustration due to the failure of the government to investigate reports of acts of corruption by the vice president, the judiciary, and the police. Now, I didn't see any story in the newspapers or in the segments of the press that I'm referring to that spoke to corruption in respect of the judiciary. I didn't see any story in the press about corruption in relation to the police force. And that's what was asked. There is public frustration due to the failure of the government to investigate reports of acts of corruption by vice president, judiciary, and police. The judiciary and the police were completely ignored. And all the stories in these segments of the press focused on corruption, this allegation of corruption in respect of the vice president. Importantly, no details were given in relation to the allegations in respect of the vice president, in respect of the judiciary, or in respect of the police. No particulars for one to understand what they were referring to. But segments of the Guyana, Guyanese media plucked out Vice President Jack Dale, and he becomes the focus. And they conveyed the impression that Guyana is being grilled at this United Nation forum regarding corruption allegedly committed by the Vice President when an allegation was not even made about the corruption or particulars of what they're speaking about were not even articulated. But most importantly, the judiciary and the police force were completely ignored. And Mr. Jack Dale becomes the focus of the press stories. And then there is public frustration from where, which segment of the public is frustrated by this allegation of corruption in respect of the vice president? The vice president walks this country almost on a daily basis, and wherever he goes, he's flocked by hundreds of Guyanese. The Vice President faces the press on a weekly basis and a hostile press too. And I don't hear frustration being expressed and vented in relation to allegations embroiling the Vice President in corruption. So where is this public frustration that they are referring to. And then when one, this, and this statement comes from a singular person, some American. And when I decide, when I scrutinize this story further, then you realize that this is driven 
by only the opposition in Guyana. Who has held on tenaciously to this Vice News story? Is one set of people led by Aubrey Norton. Every occasion they get, they bring this back into the news stream. Something that is not even newsworthy. The vice president answered the question or the questions surrounding his involvement with this character called Sue. At the interview itself, the vice president has spoken numerous times publicly and at press conferences, being interrogated by reporters on this issue. The vice president has filed legal proceedings against this Sue person. As far as I am aware, the person left the country. It took months before the proceedings were eventually served upon him. I am informed that he has neither entered an appearance nor filed a defense to the lawsuit filed against him by the vice president. And that is where the matters are. But from the moment an opportunity presents itself to put him in a bad light, you have this outpouring from certain segments of the media. Guyana did exceedingly well, I am told, in defending itself at this forum on important matters these matters don't find themselves in the press this non-story however because it involves Vice President Jack Dale who is the General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party it becomes premium news and prime news to the exclusion of everything else. And you know, when we speak about corruption, I would like to reflect just prior to the 2015 elections, when you had this whole narrative of allegations of corruption against the People's Progressive Party, they were so overwhelming coming from AP and UAFC. They created the impression that there were mountains and mountains of corruption under the PPP government. They went to the elections and the main platform campaign theme was rooting out corruption. And they got the population apparently to believe them. According to them in every office, in every ministry, there was rampant corruption. And then they got into government. And President Granger himself, after a few months, said he cannot find evidence of corruption. This overwhelming evidence of corruption that they were speaking about when they were in the opposition, they now come into government. They have all the ministries under their control. They have all the public records under their control. They have the machinery of the state under their control. And the president had to concede that it is difficult to find the evidence of corruption. But they didn't stop there. They chose 
auditors. They handpicked auditors of their own choosing. Some of these auditors were part of the narrative alleging corruption. Winston Jordan handpicked them and paid them $133 million to do forensic audits in violation of all the procurement process. No public tendering, just handpicked, selected persons to do forensic audit. One would have thought that having handpicked persons and the corruption being so overwhelming and having the state's machinery to support these auditors and being in government and providing all the materials which they have access to in government to give to these auditors so that they can find this corruption that they were speaking about when they were outside of government. They chose about 22 agencies that they felt were extraordinarily corrupt. Ministry of Public Works, Ministry of Housing, Ministry of um, Health, NISIL, and a whole host, 20 something other agencies and ministries within the government that they said were reeking with corruption. They send in these hand-picked auditors to do forensic audits, giving them all the information in the public system. And what these auditors came up with? What these auditors came up with? No evidence of corruption. No evidence of corruption. That is why they had to end up manufacturing charges. In relation to me, a couple of books, they manufactured that. In relation to Ashley Singh for the sale of movie Tongland. In relation to Irfan Ali, the development of Pradoville. Manufactured charges. Nothing came out of this forensic audits. And then you had their litany of corruption that then followed suit. And the United Nations, this guy, this US person, is not asking about that. He's asking about And, you know, the people who are asking these questions, they do not understand how our constitutional structure works. They do not understand how government in a constitutional democracy like ours works. So they're asking the government about investigating reports. Government does not investigate I keep saying that over and over. They are assigned agencies within the state structure that have investigative powers in law. You have the Guyana Police Force. You have the Auditor General. You have SOKU. You have the Guyana Revenue Authority. You have the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. You have Guyana Forestry Commission. You have the Guyana Energy Agency. All these agencies, they are not government. They are state agencies. Government, these are agencies with investigative powers. Gov Central government doesn't have investigative powers. The people who are asking these questions, they are unacquainted with and not educated about 
our governance structure and our constitution. Imagine they are asking about the government investigating the judiciary. You could imagine tomorrow if President Ali announces that the government should investigate the judiciary, what will happen in Guyana? You will hear from now until thy kingdom come that that is interference with the judiciary. That is executive pressuring the judiciary. You will hear about undermining and violating the doctrine of separation of powers. You will hear about violation of the constitution. You will hear about an attack on the independence of the judiciary. But yet, you have a person who doesn't understand these ramifications and the constitutional implications and the prohibitions which the law imposes on the government is asking the government at the UN, high level at the UN, about public frustration in government's failure to investigate reports of corruption in the judiciary. But nobody focuses, as I said, as I said, no one focusing on the judiciary and the police that were asked in the same sentence. Everyone focuses, everyone focusing on the vice president because of politics. This American guy who is asking this question obviously must have been influenced by what the APNU AFC did in Washington. Recall that they went there to have this big conference and confabulation about racism and corruption. Nothing came out of it, another hot potato. Well, this, is, this guy seemed to be borrowing from that propaganda and from that propagandistic engagement which was held in Washington, D.C. So I just thought that I would spend some time in addressing this matter to say that it is nothing other than a mountain being made out of a molehill. It's much ado about nothing, but they're converting it into something. They want to convert it into a, new, into a premium new story because of the person whom they wish to implicate in a scandal. They say that the police did it. How would the police investigate? How, how do you get the police to activate an investigation in Guyana? You are, you are living here. How do you get a police to investigate an allegation in New York? You don't have to go and make a report. Which one of the persons who believe that Mr. Jagdeo may have committed some wrong made a report to the police? And what report can they say? What report can they make? That a man named Sue says that he's a, a collector for Mr. Jack Dale? And that is it? Is that the basis? I could sit down here and say, I'm, am I a collector for Norton? Or I'm a collector for you, whoever you are. Should that be the basis of an investigation? And then, as I said, the man could not have been found. But it is because of the person. It is because it is Yagdeo. And because it is the PVP. That is the reaction. Every day, one of Mr. Norton's senior member in Region 6, said to two other senior leaders in his party 
that Mr. Norton was instructing him to sign blank checks. Blank checks. I mean, that was party funds. But I don't know which funds they're talking about in relation to Mr. Jack Liu. But party funds. And that didn't make the news. I didn't see that it may be that, that, that part of the news. Look at this. How many scandals? And those are not making the news. If they make the news, it's one day. And it's gone. But let a PPP member or a PPP minister or a PPP leader is somehow implicated in a negative act. And that will be running day in, day out, day in, day out in the press. So I thought that I will spend some time in addressing that issue that is occupying front pages of the newspapers. So my attention was drawn to a letter written by Mr. Vincent Alexander, the APNU-AFC commissioner at GCOM. And in the letter, Mr. Alexander makes a strange allegation against me. He says in the letter that I must answer for the thousands of dead people who voted at the last elections and that I have the evidence of the dead people who voted or the people from overseas who were not in Guyana but who voted or in whose name a vote was cast. Well, Mr. Alexander, I don't have any such information. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I mean, I may be extraordinarily talented and I, I, you, must, um, you must think that I have some exceptional powers, but I don't have any such information. In fact, I don't think, I don't, I don't know that those things happened. It is you and your party who are making these allegations. And one would suppose that you and your party would have that evidence. How are you calling upon me to disclose that evidence? I don't understand. I never said that I know or I believe that dead people voted or persons who were outside of Guyana on election day voted in Guyana on election day. I don't know how that is possible. I never participated or attempted to rig or rig elections. You and your party are known across the globe for doing that. There are documentaries done by foreign agencies explaining in great details how you rigged the various elections. You're throwing that at my doorstep. You and your party, you were sitting at GCOM. The elections were rigged under your stewardship. And you still at the job? Why don't you resign as a result of your incompetence? If the elections were rigged according to you and thousands of people who were not in Guyana were allowed to vote, what are you still doing at GCOM? You don't think you should resign in shame and out of, of, out of an admission of incompetence? The other issue is you and your party filed elections petitions and you said that you will prove the fraud at those elections petitions. Now, through the incompetence of your lawyers, none of the petitions saw the light of day. Now, you can't blame me for that. 
You have to blame your lawyers for that. So you got an opportunity to produce the evidence, but you and your team were so incompetent that you, your, your elections petition did not survive. It was struck out on failure to comply with the rules. You want to blame me for that? But more importantly, now that you didn't get an opportunity to lead the evidence through your petition, please, if you have evidence that elections were rigged, produce them. Produce the evidence. Why are you keeping it? Why are you calling on me? You claim that these people voted who should not vote. You claim that there is documentary evidence. You file a petition. I presume that you would have gone and led that evidence in the petition. But for whatever reason, your legal team couldn't, couldn't do the petition properly. They couldn't prosecute a petition properly. So it was dismissed. Well, make public the evidence that you have. If you didn't get to lead it in court, put it on the internet and the world see. Or worse yet, or better yet, just put out your statements of poll. Better yet, just put out the statements of poll. I can't imagine that you, you and your party keep harking that the elections were rigged, that you won the elections, but up to now you're not producing your statements of poll. Mr. Alexander, I would invite you to stop writing in the newspapers and put your statements of poll out. The evidence that you have that the elections were corrupt and rigged, put your evidence out. The newspapers will carry it. Post it on Facebook. Send it to me then, and I will make it public for you. Don't attribute to me evidence of rigged elections. I never participated in rigged elections. It's legendary that APNU, PNC, you and your cabal do that. Not me and the People's Progressive Party. So, another issue that is making the news is complaints lodged by the Bar Association of Barbados against judges in Barbados. And the complaints relate to the alleged failure of judges in Barbados to write decisions within the time prescribed by the Barbadian Constitution, which also provides that a persistent failure to write decisions within the time prescribed can lead to dismissal. Now, delay has been a chronic problem in Guyana as well. Guyanese from all walks of life are complaining and have complained. And many of you are listening to the program against the sloth at which the legal and judicial system work. Many, as a politician, I walk one end of this country to another. And whichever community I go, I meet with persons who raise with me their case or cases that are pending in the system here in Guyana 
and that the matters are not being heard and determined quickly. Specifically, allegations are being made and have been made that the judges are not writing their decisions in time. Guyana, like Barbados, has, well, Barbados has it in its constitution, but we have a legislation that mandates judges to write decisions after hearing submissions and arguments in a case within a prescribed time. That prescribed time, I believe, is four months or 120 days. But let's even say it's six months, which I think is a position in Barbados. This law, the time limit for decision, for Judicial Decisions Act, has been passed nearly 15 years now and it is not being complied with. Now I know that there have been shortages of judges and there have been many reasons, many issues affecting the judiciary. But there is a law and this law must be complied with. Every other person in the country is expected to comply with the laws of this land. The executive is held to comply with the law. Every agency of state is enjoined to obey the law. No agency is above the law. That is the essence of what we call the rule of law. In Guyana also, like Barbados, our constitution provides that a judge can be removed from office for not writing decisions in a timely manner. Article 197, subparagraph 3, 197, subparagraph 3 reads, a judge may be removed from office only for inability to perform the functions of his or her office, whether arising from infirmity of mind or body or any other cause, or for misbehavior, or for persistently not writing decisions, or for continuously failing to give decisions and reasons, therefore, within such time as may be specified by Parliament and shall not be so removed except in accordance with the provisions of this article. So, a judge can be removed from his inability to perform his function, either through infirmity of mind or body, two, for misbehavior, and three, for persistent refusal or failure to write decisions in the manner prescribed by Parliament. Parliament has passed a law prescribing the time within which decisions must be written by judicial officers. That law is not being 
complied with. Like Barbados, Guyana has a bar association. We are going to have judges appointed, more judges appointed, and there will be an expectation that the law in relation to the writing of decisions within the prescribed time will be obeyed. I will leave it at that for the time being. So I am looking at your comments and as I said, if you wish me to address any questions you have, then of course send me the question and I will try my best to answer whatever questions you ask. A reporter from the newsroom has asked me a question to speak, to address the issue of contract, contract delays. Now it is already a matter of public record that the government is viewing the breach of contracts by contractors in respect of contracts entered into with the government of Guyana and or state agencies seriously. The President, Minister of Public Works, Minister Egil, and yours truly, and perhaps other colleagues, ministers, have spoken publicly on this matter. At the level of cabinet, a decision was made that wherever breaches occur and there is no satisfactory explanation, then the clauses of the contract will be imposed will be enforced swiftly and rigidly. Some of these clauses impose upon the contractor a regime of penalties for breach and or delay. These penalties include liquidated damages. Some of them include the option of the government to repudiate the contract or terminate the contract and also to sue for damages. Cabinet has decided that ministers and heads of departments must activate these contractual provisions when there is a breach or there is an unexplained delay in the discharge of contracts and contractual obligations. That process has already been triggered, but it is a process notifications in writing in accordance with the contract have to be given to the contractor. Based upon the terms of the contract, time may also have to be given to the contractor to remedy the breach or the default before the actual imposition of the penalty whether it is liquidated damages or some other 
sanction. I wish to assure you, reporter, that this process, that the government is pursuing this course and the relevant state agencies are pursuing this course rigorously. Government has made commitments to the public about the delivery of projects within certain agreed time frames. And government is bent to deliver those promises in accordance with the time frame promised. In any event, government will not countenance negligence from contractors, government will not countenance delinquency, government will not countenance breaches of contractual obligations. These contracts are multi-million dollars in nature, so it's not a question of contractors not making money. There are cases where a delay may be justified or a breach may be justified. Each case will have to be looked at on a case-to-case -case basis. Government is not unreasonable. It's not our intention to penalize unjustly and unjustifiably anyone or any contractor. Government is not in the business of engaging in those practices. Government is, would be happy if we don't even have to activate these clauses in the contract. We would be the happiest group of people if all the contractors or every contractor were to bring in their contract and contractual obligations in time. Don't you think we would be happy if that's the state of affairs? Unfortunately, it is not. And contractors must understand that sanctions will flow. You cannot breach your contracts with impunity. As I said, we are reviewing the process as already begun of reviewing the Public Procurement Act, the Pro Procurement Act, with a view of strengthening it, making the whole procurement process more transparent and more accountable. And we are doing this not to penalize anybody or to be punitive, we are doing this simply to improve accountability and to improve transparency so that at the end of the day, the people of Guyana must get their money's worth. That is the government's priority, to ensure that taxpayers' money are properly spent and that you, the people of Guyana, are getting your dollars worth. There is no other intent which the government has in relation to this matter. So I hope that I have addressed that matter for the reporter. The last issue I want to deal with is the GTU versus Attorney General case. As you know, the GTU through its lawyers, well, lawyer, Mr. Darren Wade, filed an application which was heard today in which he sought 
to amplify a case already fixed for hearing and in which he sought remedies and reliefs that are completely misconceived and remedies and reliefs that a, a court cannot grant in law. They are what is called unknown to the law. And the case was filed out of a lack of understanding of procedures, and I say so with the greatest of respect. We were forced to file an application to strike it out, which we did. And it was struck out today. Well, the court allowed Mr. Wade to withdraw the proceedings. As it was plagued and riddled, riddled with technical deficiencies and, and errors. For example, the gentleman is asking the court to commit the Chief Elections Office of a contempt. Now, contempt is a serious thing. There's a particular procedure that you have to comply with if you're alleging contempt of court. Contempt of court has imprisonment as a penalty. It's a quasi-criminal matter. You gotta show strictly that an order of court was served, that it had what is called a penal notice, and that it was breached. And you have to do so by a special procedure, which the law sets out in the rules. And you have to show the evidence clearly and establish beyond reasonable doubt that the court order was breached. It's not something you can stick in, in some application and rush to the court. So all of that happening in this case. And this case is really developing a life of its own. Today the judge decides to order cross-examination. These are cases that are what are called judicial review proceedings. Cross-examination is rarely ever ordered. But here the judge feels that he has two competing factual narratives, one from the teachers' union and one from the, the Ministry of Education. And he believes that cross-examination will reconcile these differences, and, and that's how you reconcile differences, but he also ordered certain documents which um, have to be produced tomorrow. So tomorrow, I believe at 10, the case resumes in the High Court, and um, the judge clarified today that he will also, in addition to cross-examination, he will hear the final submissions from the parties. Um, all three sides, because there are now three sides. The judge joined the, the Trade Union Congress of Guyana. And that Trade Union Congress is represented by Mr. Rysdale Ford, senior counsel. And of course there is Darren Wade, appearing for the Guyana Teachers Union, and yours truly appearing in person, because the Attorney General, as you know, is part of the proceedings. So the trial of the case will begin tomorrow, hopefully it ends tomorrow, and we will await the determination of the case. So this is where we have come to the end of tonight's program. I am being reminded to remind you that 
we will be celebrating Holi this weekend, Pagwa, and that is before we meet. So I want to take this opportunity to wish each and every one of you, in particular, my Hindu brothers and sisters, Happy Holi. Please enjoy Pagwa. Be safe. Pagwa is still a religious festival and we have to remember that. It's not a festival that one engages in certain activities that I see have penetrated the celebration of holy in recent times. So please respect the pious nature and the religious underpinnings of this great festival of Pagwa and happy holy to you and your family. And until we meet again, good evening, stay safe and stay well. I will meet with you again, not Tuesday, as I'll be out of the country. I have to represent the government in Europe, so will not, I will not be here next Tuesday. Take care and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much.